The Y Curve with Phil Dobby and Roger Hearing. Global prices soaring, inflation and wages chasing each other higher and higher. Except in China. The world's second largest economy is seeing deflation and stagnation, big problems in getting its people to buy anything, and its largest companies tottering. The big questions, why is it happening, and how will we, the rest of the world, be affected when the country that has seen the biggest global economic expansion begins to falter? That's our subject today on The Y Curve. Brought to you by Wigmore Associates. The Y Curve. Okay, I mean, there's a lot going on in China right now, unpack. and we've seen data over the the last few days, over the last week, about uh, just how much they are on the slide. So we know the property sector is in turmoil. Imports and exports are well down. Bank loans have fallen considerably, so mm. they're borrowing less. Foreign investors are getting out of Chinese shares. It's like the perfect storm. Growth forecasts are all being downgraded. The tech sector, they've got those it's, attacks coming at it from the yeah, US. It, it's a massive mess. And the interesting thing is, well, two things, really. One, a, as, I, as I'm sure our expert will tell us, we're not actually that sure about the data coming out of China because no one's quite sure how accurate it is. No, but normally, we yes, it's normally questioned because it might yeah, be too good. Absolutely. But now it's not looking good at all. Well, but then so. you think, well, if it's still too good, then, then what does that tell us things <laughs> are even worse? Even, is it even worse? Absolutely. Well, it's that. But also, how does it affect the rest of us? We are so tied in mm. to the Chinese economy. Uh, all of us. The, the, but, the, the yeah. problem. But I wonder whether, and you know, it'll be interesting to examine this a little bit on the the podcast today. Whether actually part of China's problems is that we're less connected. So is the decoupling meaning we are demanding less in the way of Chinese goods because mm. we are starting to produce more domestically? Well, certainly the case for the United States. And what got me onto that thinking was there were some trade numbers last week which showed that the amount of exports from China had fallen significantly last month. But the uh, but the number of imports into the U.S. Mm. globally, I don't know how much of it from China, had only fallen a little bit. And yet, you know, supposedly, I think about a fifth of uh, U.S. imports come from China. So if we'd seen this big fall in exports, yeah. surely we'd see it reflected something in, else going in, on. in U.S. trade figures. So, yes, so there's something else going on. So has the, have we been decoupling and is that part of the problem? The other thing is, as yeah. well, is if, they, if they're seeing prices fall and they're still exporting, why wouldn't we be seeing that having a deflationary impact on, on, on the rest the, of the world? Well, well this, this is a question I want to put out there because there, there certainly is a suggestion that we might benefit from it, though I think a lot of export, experts think that isn't the case. But the other thing is yes maybe it's because we're decoupling or are we decoupling because we can see that the ship is sinking mm. uh you know it, it's a thing that feeds back on itself yeah well i mean certainly you know i mean inflation has been brought by about by supply chain disruptions and have we found alternative ways over the last couple of years so is that is that mm. what's happening and then you know there's the whole tech story as well i mean china i think sees their way out of this by saying well we are going to be leaders in artificial intelligence mm. and maybe they will and we're going to you know start selling more electric cars and be big on tech uh, but we're not happy about that well, I mean the West isn't happy about that Joe Biden isn't happy about that indeed. so he's trying to stop US investors putting money into any companies that have got anything to do with AI in China basically well also of course there's the whole microchip issue which is that China yes produces some but they're not the highest quality the highest quality comes from Taiwan mm. from TSMC and they are emptying em, em, they are creating these big uh, concerns to do this el- out of Taiwan in, the, in, in, in Germany now and in Arizona um, to make microchips, and the world runs on microchips. Yeah. So the point is that China's uh, economic dominance is going to be a bit of a problem if it can't have access even to some of these. And the other thing that China, you know, has been trying to do, because it, I mean, it's been seeing that you know the, the future isn't as bright as it has been in terms of international trade. That they wanted to build up more of a domestic economy. And that's not working for them either. I mean, people are just not spending. People are not borrowing. And so that, that, that is part of their problem as well. Just this big fall in domestic demand. So there's that to examine as well. But look, uh, it, it is a concern. And how much of your money is tied to investments that might be suffering because of China? Because that is the danger when you, you know, just leave mm. things alone rather than actively manage your investment. Things happen. Your investments or assets can suddenly lose money. If you don't keep an eye on it, you really need to keep across everything, everything that is going on. On or find the world. people that are across Or it. find people who do. Exactly. And that's exactly my point. And that's when you need to talk to the people at Wigmore Associates, because they do keep an eye on these things. 
uh, working to your goals, whether it's uh, building up a retirement fund, ensuring that there's lots of money left over for your kids or planning for that second home or third home or fourth home, depending on how you're doing, or a major renovation of any of those properties. Uh, whatever that your goals, uh, they'll manage your portfolio to ensure that you're getting strong returns without uh, giving away too much to the tax man and making sure that you're immune to any of the problems that are happening around the world. So if that sounds like the sort of help you could do with, get in touch with them at Wigmore Associates, wigmore-associates.co.uk. You'll find their email on their website as well, or you can give them a call on 020 724 3400 there and, we are. And please do, because they help us with this podcast. Now, China. Yes, let's talk to Kent Matthews. He's Professor of Banking and Finance at Cardiff Business School, and he joins us now. So, Kent, I mean, there's been more data, hasn't there, this week from China? I mean, fixed asset investment is slowing, industrial production is slowing, retail sales are down a lot, although, you know, still up 2.5% year on year, which actually is more than most countries. But the unemployment rate is tipping up as well. We've just seen bad import and export data. Uh, so at this one country where we're used to only getting good news, whether we believe the good news or not, it's normally just being good news. So how bleak is it? Or is it just, uh, to use that sort of old phrase, is it just transitory? Is this part of just uh, just get, coming out of COVID and getting back to normal? Right. Well, it's a combination of factors. And, and I would like to think it's transitory because the one thing that the Chinese authorities can do is move fast. Uh, they don't, they're not encumbered by uh, the usual kind of uh, processes or uh, democratic processes and good processes, I should say, uh, that we have mm. over here. I mean, they're an authoritarian government, and if they want to move fast, they can move fast. So what's stopping them from doing that? Well, let's look at the, the combination of factors. One combination, of course, is, is external, and that is that the world is still not out of the, uh, the, uh, out of the COVID uh, the crisis. We're, we're still you know, uh, tumbling along at a, at, a, at a low growth rate, so world trade is still low. On top of it, of course, we have the tension with, with, with the USA. Um, but these are external factors which I know, you know, eventually they go away because, you know, you, you, you can't carry on like this. You can't decouple forever. At some point in time, you come to an accommodation. With China, what's happened is that part of the uh, political po the policy that comes from the, the political uh, uh, center is that they've been micromanaging many of the kind of the, of the industries, uh, private industries, and favoring going back to favoring the uh, state-owned industries. And the argument for this is is very much sort of uh, uh, controlled by the Communist Party. Uh, what Deng Xiaoping did was to liberalize and give greater freedom to the private sector. And for a long time, this enabled the private sector to take risks and get the just rewards from those risks. Um, the result has been in the path for, to growth has been this increasing inequality. And this inequality has created um, sufficient imbalances to, to make the Communist Party think that, you know, um, their, their purpose is essentially not to to encourage inequality, although they 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 did that as uh, as part of the growth process, but it's gone in in their eyes too far. But then ideologically, they're pushing back, as you say, in effect, on that. But in a, because that gives them control, and you were saying that they can move very fast because they're, they they don't have to uh, get people's permission before doing anything. But it also means they can't be presumably sensitive to the normal processes of of capitalism and, and the way the market works. Well, I don't agree with that because I actually think they they are very sensitive to it. That that when things are good. They think that you can actually control the market, and then when they're when things are bad, they realise they can't. Right? The the the, the Communist Party are, are just control freaks. They you know they 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 say one thing. They want to liberalise, for instance, take take the currency. They want to internationalise the currency. To internationalise the currency, the renminbi uh, means that they have to give way on capital controls, exchange controls, and they cannot control the market, the foreign exchange market, as they control their domestic market. Now, uh, they can't have it both ways. They can't internationalize and control it. So th they're caught between these two things. They want to show that they're a, a great power. They want to be there in the international world, but they can't uh, uh, give up on, on, on their control. So that's the same thing here. I mean, you know, they, 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 they want to control things, and it's a good idea to control things when things are good. When growth is good, you know, and there's inequality, 
you, most people can think they can control things. It's only when, contro- uh, when growth is bad and the economy is going down the chutes that you realize you can't control everything. So the inequality that you're talking about, though, are you talking about the inequality between various sectors, between uh, state-owned enterprises and, and private enterprises, or are you talking about inequality within the, within the population as a whole? What sort of inequality are you talking about? There? They're, they're interconnected, aren't they? I mean, the, uh, the population mm. as a whole, there's huge inequality. In fact, I think a few years ago, I gave a lecture to um, one of the uh, uh, at a conference uh, which looked at inequality, and ironically, you know, all the the, the measures of inequality, Gini coefficients, you know, and, and called the measures of inequality, well, actually showed that the UK had less inequality than China. You know, so China is a country that's got a huge amount of inequality. And a lot of this is to do with the development of private enterprise and private companies. Uh, one of the greatest engines for growth in, in China is the small and medium-sized enterprises. From these small enterprises, you know, because they're uh, not encumbered by many of the regulations we face here, they can grow into, into big companies. Uh, what, what, what they do is that these small businesses, they start off small and then they, they, they exploit a scale economies and they get large. And, you know, as they get large, they get rich. So that's how much of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the inequality is caused, both from a personal income point of view and, and from the corporates. But that means a lot of people in the society are, do not participate in the prosperity, presumably. And that, I guess, has its own political problems in the sense of you have a, 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 a group of people in the, in the country who do not perhaps trust, do not partake in the prosperity and therefore aren't benefiting from it. Again, this is part of the control process. You know, in in China, there are controls on internal migration. It's very difficult to control, but they are officially there. So, for instance, the the hukou system, which is where where people come from different provinces to, to the provinces where there is work, they are unable to get the benefits for their family uh, when they do come, they can't register their children for school, they, uh, for, for, for health and all the other kinds of benefits. So what happens is that the men folk come out there and work and then migrate back you know, uh, to their original provinces. Th- these are regulations which they have created themselves. It's very hard for these people to actually get themselves up because they come up against this kind of glass wall where they can see how other people are are getting rich, and they're not able to do that because of various labor restrictions. So I think, you know, I mean, uh, it's partly self-inflicted. It's because they've got all these controls everywhere. They think they're doing good. Or maybe, I don't know what they think, actually, but they think that they're, uh, they're, they're doing But in fact, they're actually exacerbating the inequalities. So that, so, uh, so that, yeah. that growth, though, I mean, if, so when you're describing what is fundamentally a capitalist system in a way, aren't you? And that if you've got an opportunity uh, and you can get a loan on the cheap, OK, that's not quite so, cap- so capitalism because it, it probably comes from a, a loan that's been given uh, by a, a state owned bank at a very low rate to try and incentivize you to, to grow. But fundamentally, you are following the capitalist pr- practice of uh, getting a great idea building a business and seeing it grow with the benefit of a huge population to to serve uh why would that stop all of a sudden why would it stall okay well first of all let me uh, uh, um, explain the process of how they get this credit okay the credit actually doesn't go to the small businesses directly despite the fact that the government has tried to get the banks to um provide credit to smes the uh, SME credit from the official banking system is parlous. How they do it is through two sources. One is that the banks own, lend to safe state-owned enterprises. And again, that's an issue of control. If a bank, remember, uh, most of the banks, or rather the large part of the banking sector is owned by the government, it's state-owned banks, about 51%, 52% of the, of the banking system is owned by the the state and the others that are private through various holding companies, if you actually trace them all the way through, they come down to being owned by uh, provincial governments, which are ultimately part of the state. So um, this is very much a state dominated banking sector. Banks don't take risks because individuals in the banks, if they take risks and and it goes all wrong, pear-shaped, you know, uh, you 
we don't know what's going to happen. A lot of these people um, are, are people who want to move on in the Communist Party uh, uh, system. They want to climb up the uh, the bureaucracy and, and, and the Communist Party system, which basically ends up back in Beijing. So they don't want to block their copybook and, and have any bad loans. They do have bad loans, but they don't want to have too many of them. So they lend to state-owned enterprises. Many of these state-owned enterprises are low productive uh, uh, industries, which don't actually use that money to invest in their own uh, uh, products or in their own business, but they lend them through um, entrusted loans to the SMEs. So money passes through from the banks to state-owned enterprises and then on to the uh, SMEs. So that's how they get it. Now, the SMEs pay a high premium for this. The, the other route is through shadow banks. Shadow banks uh, uh, are essentially private equity type of uh, organizations that then uh, use uh, ways of raising funds through uh, various means, and they lend uh, to the SMEs. One of the ways they do it is through the wealth, manage uh, uh, wealth management products, which are sold by the state-owned banks. Now, now the, 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 the Chinese regulators aren't, aren't, aren't daft. They, they know about this and they've tried to, to control this. But in doing so, they've actually clamped down on things like shadow banks, making it harder for SMEs to get finance. So how much, how significant that is that then responsible for the slowdown that we're seeing? Because presumably that sort of arrangement that you saw is why we've seen this, this explosion in bad debt, particularly in the, uh, in, in the building sector, in the construction sector. I think that's partly true, but that's actually been happening from about 2018. Mm. So it, it started to happen before COVID. I think the COVID is obviously a, a, a situation that affected all economies and the China economy as well. Uh, and so coming out of COVID, there needs to be a, a cheap credit. But the, the point is that there's been increased indebtedness, both uh, at the government sector and in various sectors such, such as uh, uh, um, real estate. Um, so is now, that clampdown then responsible for the slowdown by and large? Uh, I think the clampdown came earlier you know, I, I don't think I can't I can't blame the clampdown, uh, the, the slowdown now for the clampdown that occurred some time ago. The clampdown was making things worse. So growth was actually falling even before COVID. And, you know, we have COVID, of course, you know, that, that that's a big blank period. But they haven't reversed this. And in fact, I they, they raised interest rates most recently, I think yesterday. OK, so um, what's needed here is that this is a situation where the government interference or, or signals that they're sending to the private sector are ones that the private sector are no longer willing to take risks and invest. Right. OK, well, give, given all that, as you say, and it sounds like a system that is effectively for, uh, over quite a long period, in fact, grinding to a bit of a halt, certainly being non-flexible, non-effective. Is there any hope of it turning around in, in a way that will get things back on track? Or is this a permanent, necessary part of the function? It's the age-old story of debt, isn't it? Yeah. You, once you've accumulated that debt, the economy slows down because how do you get out of that situation? You've got to, you've got to recover that debt, and that's a very slow process. Well, that's a, that is a very slow process, but it really dip, depends on, on the, the debt interest. Uh, that uh, that's generated. Now, if your growth is higher than your ability to pay, then you can grow yourself out of the debt. Okay. Now, China has always had spectacular growth rates. I mean, and, and their growth rates have always been higher than their interest rates and the, their real interest rates. Uh, and so what's, what's the difference now? Well, the difference now is that if people are not taking risks and they're conserving their consumption, then their savings are too high. They're actually there's excess savings now. Now this is very old-fashioned economics. You know, e e even the sort of stuff that says if no one's going to spend, then with an excess of savings, interest rates have to fall. Yeah, it's, e it's echoes of, of stagflation in Japan, isn't it? Really, it's always that's that. right. That's right. It is it's echoes of it. But you can get out of this because the government can run a fiscal policy. They can run a deficit. Now they're just yeah. they're just. Being uh, orthodox in the sense of that they're, they're paying lip service to the argument that if you create debt, you have to pay it back. Well, in fact, actually, governments don't have to pay back. They can just keep on rolling it over as long as growth is greater than their debt interest, the interest rate they pay on their debt. 
So and why so why aren't they doing that? Because they're not adverse to uh, to raising government debt. But, and as you said, they can move very quickly, and yet they don't seem to be, do they? So they've got this fear then, presumably, that actually, even if they do that, they're not going to see enough growth okay. coming from it. Well, you, I mean, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I don't have an insight into the Communist Party, but I do have friends in the Communist Party. I mean, I have friends in the Communist Party. So, um, uh, and what they tell me is that when you say they, who's they? You know, I mean, it's it's an authoritarian government. It's autocratic, which means that Xi Jinping ha- has the final say. But they are factions inside the Communist Party. They all have different views. They all have different interests. They 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 they're all, you know, making their own case. And eventually, you know, I I always described the workings of the the Communist Party in China a bit like the Roman Catholic Church. You know, that uh, there is a pope, he's he's the boss, but inside there are all sorts of factions. They fight each other and they they come up with a policy. Once they come up with a policy, they all close ranks and they say, this is it. Okay, so um, I don't know why they don't do it. You know, there are obviously smart people in China who are arguing that we should have fiscal policy and there are those who are saying not and for all sorts of reasons and they may well be thinking in terms of you know well uh, if there's a a fiscal policy that could um, raise interest rates that could have an adverse effect on the exchange rate adverse effect on the exchange rate will have an effect on their exports Uh, if uh, if the exchange rate rises many chinese companies operate on very thin margins right those margins get evaporated if the exchange rate appreciates so there are factions here there's the export sector there's the you know economists. There's the domestic sector. They want to promote domestic consumption. A rising exchange rate will 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 help in that. So they've got all sorts of factions yeah, in there, and, and, and it depends obviously who comes out on top of it. But I suppose Ken, the point is, if things continue as they are, and as a general rule, one expects that, yeah, particularly in big authoritarian systems. Are we going to see more of this? Are we going to see more Evergrands? Are we going to see more uh, collapses of, of, of exports and, uh, and things like this? Is this a, a trajectory we can expect to keep going? No. Uh, well, this is where I, I, I disagree, because I think there are enough smart people in the party who will then come, uh, with, come up with a different policy when they see more Evergrands, when they see uh, uh, debt piling up and, in, uh, and uh, fragility in the economy. I think... Raising interest rates is the wrong move because that penalizes the the growth part of the economy, the SMEs. That has the effect of tightening both for the state-owned enterprises, which you might say, well, it's no big deal. There's not much investment going in there anyway, but most importantly to the private sector. So raising interest rates is a bad idea. This would have been been a better idea was for the government to announce uh, an expansion policy. Uh, and and there are many things that the government can spend on. You know, I, I did some research work to show, look at where are the areas that get the biggest bang for their buck. And, and actually, it turns out to be in the welfare sector. Rather than spending more on, on uh, health and education, what they've done is they've gone into um, looking into corruption in these sectors, particularly in the health sector. They said, we've spent all this money and it's not getting out to where it has to go to. And so they've been doing an anti-corruption drive. Well, that's a good good idea. But the, the, the thing is, is that it, it inhibits even further investment. Yeah. Because and and that's, isn't doesn't... anti-corruption often just a cover for actually a political purge of your of your opponents as much as that? But it's another, it's another example in a different way, isn't it, of a clampdown, you know, at a time when you should be looking for growth. Uh, well, I, you can interpret it that way. And certainly they've used that as cover, you know, for getting rid of people. But even if you had an anti-corruption process in countries where there are lots of regulations and lots of controls... Uh, and it's authoritarian, there's an optimal amount of corruption. You have to have some to get around these controls, right? If you're going to have them, you know, you're going to have some corruption or nothing will work. You know, you'll, you'll be back into a Soviet system. And, 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 and under a Soviet system in, in Russia, there was a huge amount of corruption because people had to get around these controls. Okay, so, so, so you don't want to clamp down on corruption completely because what that will do is that reduce all risk-taking, OK, you've got to have some risk. Take. Either you have an open economy, a transparent economy, you know, uh, 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 something that uh, similar to what we have in the West, or you have to allow some corruption. 
You know, yeah, like, makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Look, I mean, even not even in a country, if you've worked in a big company, you know that the only way you can get around and actually get things to work is to bend some of the company rules a little bit. You can't I, say I, things I, like I, that. I've heard from people. Yeah. So uh, what about the decoupling of China from the West? So this, I couldn't help noticing because, I mean, exports from China fell by 14.5% in July. Imports also down by 12.4%. So that's how much, you know, the economy is slowing down. So even sort of a consumption on imported goods is down. Whereas U.S. imports, the same period, fell just 1%. Now, in recent times, almost a fifth of U.S. imports have been coming from China. So you would have expected that fall in China exports would have a bigger impact on imports in the United States. So I just wonder, are they becoming a lot less dependent? Is that one of the repercussions of COVID that we found different ways, different supply chains, and we the West is decoupling itself from China a bit. Is that part of the problem as well? It's part of, it's an adjustment problem. Decoupling is actually a, a very strong word. You know, yeah. you're never going to decouple from China. What you're doing is diversifying, and that's absolutely a sensible thing for m- many uh, Western companies to do. Putting all your eggs in one basket was always a big problem, you know, because China, despite all the lip service it pays to in to free trade, and it tries to make out that they are the champions of free trade. They use trade as a weapon, all right? They use trade as a weapon. So um, it's quite right that companies diversify, but decoupling is never going to happen. It's not It's not realistic. What we're seeing is a, a movement from one equilibrium state where we had all our eggs in, in the Chinese basket to a diversified uh, uh, strategy, which I think is, is sensible, and that that's going to have an effect on China. China's problem is not so much that. I mean, that will have an effect, you know, because China itself wants to wean itself off from dependence on on the world economy and world trade. Yeah, he wants, he wants to diversify as well, absolutely, with, with absolutely, its export absolutely. countries, but also by building up more of a domestic basis. A- absolutely, and, and, and that's a sensible thing to do. But uh, um, there are headwinds that China has to look at in the longer term. You know, all these things take time, and there's a medium-term strategy to shift things into the domestic market. To do that, of course, uh, it'd, be, it'd be much better to allow for the exchange rate to be freely determined, and that will allow for the exchange rate to appreciate. That will also enable uh, consumption to move to, its, uh, to, the, to the domestic sector. Uh, uh, investment in, in health and education, essentially creating a semblance of a welfare state, means that families don't have to save. You know, they can pay their taxes and they know that there, there is a, a, a safety net, in which case they can start to spend. So all these you know, are things that can take time. The big problem China has, however, is the fundamentals, right? In, in, in growth, in the economic growth, the fundamentals are driven by uh, the labor force, the growth in the labor force, uh, the growth in capital and the growth in technology. Yeah. And the technology issue, of course, I mean, one of the big things there is their inability to produce uh, microchips, microprocessors in the way that they are elsewhere and the dependence on that. I mean, that kind of relationship is important. That kind of relationship is important. And Xi Jinping has nailed his colors to the mast that somehow the government can help to promote that kind of technology. There's some weak evidence in, 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 of, of the government being able to do that, but there are also, from history, which we know in the West, of spectacular failures of the government going into this, trying to create uh, a, a space for technology by saying, you know, that we are going to promote it through subsidies, through, through, through uh, cheap credit, uh, through innovation policies. We know from our own history, you know, from the white heat of technology uh, with Harold Wilson, we know about what, what Mitterrand tried to do in France. We know that there are many uh, uh, examples in history where the government tries to create technology and end up failing. Now, uh, Xi Jinping has no special magic formula. He, you know, he's trying to sell this idea that somehow China can do it because they are targeting certain technologies. What they've done is actually inhibit growth in that sector by going in strong, by trying to target these things, by creating regulations. So technology has, you can see this in the context of of private investment. Private investment is slowing down. I I think it's it's, it's negative at one stage, I remember. So if the government is trying to get the private sector to innovate, they're doing something wrong. They're not doing it. 
So, and a lot of that innovation, I guess, comes from cooperation with the West and and money coming in from from the West as well. So, if we, you know, if we take the, I mean, the US is clearly concerned, and, and maybe they don't have any reason to be about China taking too much of a firm lead in artificial intelligence. That's why Joe Biden is keen to ensure that American money and know how doesn't fuel that. Basically, it's a, another element of the trade war, doesn't it? So, isn't it? So we so we see that sort of regulation that's stopping American money finding its way in, but. It's it's stopping finding its way into China anyway, because, of course, you know, there's always been that trade off, hasn't there? Well, well, let's put some money into investment in China. It's a bit of a high risk, but the reward is good. The moment that reward disappears, then there's less interest in investing in China. I think that's right. I think what Biden's doing is totally and utterly unnecessary. You know, the market itself will determine where capital should go. And Chinese investors themselves aren't investing. So why on earth would American investors want to invest? So, you know, I mean, what what's happening with regulation? I think there was a there was a World Bank paper that came out, I think, last year or maybe the beginning of this year that said that China's growth, if it doesn't reform, you know, China's growth will fall to about three and a half to four percent in the long term. Uh, if they reform in the sense of they enable the, give, uh, uh, the, the private sector to take risks and keep rewards and perhaps not be, try to micromanage these, these, these industries, growth could go back to the kind of target that they have. Um, I, I also want to add on top of that, one of the other fundamentals, of course, is their workforce is declining. All right. So growth theory, it's capital, it's labor and it's technology. All these things are working against China. So, so given all that we've said about this, and we've talked obviously about what its effect is on China itself, what about the effect on the rest of us, Kent? Because we are tied in, you know, decoupling has taken place, but we are very much tied into China. China is tied in very strongly to the global economy, and we all depend on that. Uh, what is the effect likely to be if what we're seeing at the moment does continue? How are, how are we going to face this? How are we going to going to going to what are we going to inherit from this? Well, look, I'm I'm a lot more sanguine about this because you know I tend to look at the longer term rather than you know obviously there are going to be adjustment problems in the short term, but in the longer term, these demographics that China is facing are exactly the opposite from the other large uh, economy in the world. Okay, in about. 40 years, well, not even less than that, by about 2050, 24 to 2050, all right, there will be an, uh, another economy that will replace China, which has a different demographics. India has a much younger population. India will come forward as, as a growth center while China stagnates because they have a lot more older people and a lot more dependent population. So we're getting back to comparing it with Japan, aren't we, really? Well, you know, Japan also has an aging population and a high savings rate. You know, I mean, there are strong similarities. Also, Japan and China are both great holders of, of, of U.S. dollar assets. You know, they, they have uh, reserves in the, in the trillions. Uh, and you might ask yourself, how on earth are they going to pay for all this this aging population, because the aging population means that the old are going to consume, but they're not going to produce. The people who are going to produce are the young. Those young people are going to have to maintain through their taxes and their production, two parents, four grandparents and one child. So the dependency ratio is going to get larger and larger in China, whereas in India, it's the other way around. They have large families, large uh, uh, um, uh, 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 proportion of young people, and they're going to be producing more than they consume. Now, in, when countries consume more than they produce, the gap is made up through trade, right? China has a huge trade surplus. Now, over time, that will become a deficit. India will become a trade surplus country. Over the water in, in America, old people will just die off. And despite all the wall that, that, that they want to have between South America and North America, they will grow through immigration, through population mm -hmm. growth. And it'll be a young population. So funnily enough, all, all what the Chinese, or what the Americans are complaining about, you know, the Chinese are stealing our jobs and, and they've got uh, a huge uh, trade surplus against our deficit, it'll be reversed, right? America will have a trade surplus. China will have a trade deficit. China will pay for that trade deficit from its reserves. It will actually run down their reserves. It will be saving 
to meet their population, uh, 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 their demographic uh, uh, um, growth. They can't keep doing that forever, obviously. Uh, well, I mean, we're, tra- we're talking decades way course, past before it becomes a problem. Some, some, yeah. some, something will change, you know, something will mm. change. Yeah. Uh, you know, China is not going to open up to immigration, you know, so, so mm. they'll start to have children, you know, and, that, yeah. and that's the kind of so then, So then that becomes the question, then, is, is, is China such a good place to invest in now, unless you are, you know, uh, focusing on industries which are uh, looking after health care for the aged? Well, I'm I, I'm always optimistic about that because I think you know China has the potential to be mm. a high growth area, and certainly if you're willing to take a very long term view, yeah, I think China still has great growth potential. One of the problems that uh, I, I hear talking to uh, economists in China is that there are, the authorities are afraid to lift capital controls and exchange controls because they're afraid that the rich Chinese will have will uh, ensure that capital gets flown out, okay? There'll be a, a, a flight out of capital. Yes, that probably will happen. Well, if they listen to this podcast, they will. Yes, well, obviously we're not doing it in Chinese. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think a lot of rich people in China do want to get their money out, okay? But there's a lot of people outside who might want to get their money in. You remember when, when, when in the 1980, when, when we lifted our, our capital controls, you know, economists told Mrs. Thatcher, you know, that's going to have a huge capital outflow and the exchange rate will plummet. Exactly the opposite happened, all right? There was a capital inflow, exchange rate uh, uh, sh- uh, uh, appreciated. Okay, I mean, there was oil price effects as well uh, with that. But the point is that people wanted to invest in the U.K., and just as much as people wanted to get money out of the UK, there are people all over the world who want to invest long term in China. Mm. You can't tell mm. which way capital goes. No one knows. You know? So, Kent, it sounds like we're running out of time, but it does sound like what you're saying is, I mean, first of all, yes, I mean, it's a it's a population that uh, is, you know, the working population is declining. But that doesn't mean there can't be productivity improvements if they get the right sort of investment happening there. And, and obviously, they've got the, you know, the, there is the expertise and know-how to, to develop some of that. But there needs to be less control. The Communist Party's got to say, well, we've got to adapt, you know, almost like more Western ways. We've got to embrace mm. more capitalism. But they're unlikely less. to do that in the short term. I mean, and you talked about what may happen in decades. Case. But in the next 10 years, in the next five years, it sounds to me like there's a bit of an issue as to whether they'll be able to get things back on track. Well, uh, one of the, 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 the big impediments is, is, the, is the current president. You know, I mean, he, he actually believes this stuff and, he, and you know, likes other autocratic places, you know, um, uh, not far away. If you believe in this, you know, you, you, you lose credibility if you were to change your uh, tax straight away. So, it has to be a gradual process. You know, I, I, I can't predict exactly when that's going to happen. And in the short, yeah, can China period. afford a gradual process? And if you see a fall in living standards, and you see, you know, c- continued lack of investment, and people's standard of living continues to decline, that's not a, a good time to be an autocratic leader, is it? Well, not in China because it's, there's a social contract. It, it's you know, it doesn't have the same kind of repression. I mean, uh, uh, say for instance, Russia has where it's overt. In China, it, it's you know, it, it's it's under the surface. It's just kind of like a the velvet glove and and the iron. So um, that the social contract is that the middle class should be able to improve their standard of living, send their kids to foreign universities, uh, get education abroad and travel freely and all that sort of stuff. Once that social contract starts to crumble, then I think change is on the way. So could it get as bad as that in the foreseeable future? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think I think mm. the only things that can make China change is not external pressure. It's the Chinese people themselves. And I think they're educated and they're smart, they're sophisticated, and they, they know what they want. Right now, you know, they're willing to trade off in you know, a stability uh, for growth. But when growth starts to fall, it's a price even on stability. Not a short term problem we've got here, is it, yeah, Ken? Not a short term problem. We will see where it goes. Kent, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Interesting, both optimism and pessimism, depending on decades or even the next few years, but very interesting to get a sense of of where it is going at the moment. Great to talk. Okay, good. Nice talking to you. So, yeah, that was fascinating, wasn't it? Um, It was extremely interesting. I have heard so many people sort of like giving theories about what's happening in China. Mm. That's the first one, really, that actually made sense about what's really happening. And both both the good and the bad. I mean, it's been interesting at one point. (laughs) Yeah, at one point, you know, yes, surely there are intelligent people in the party who will uh, reverse uh, the direction. But not in a hurry. (laughs) 
So, look, they are. Mm. One of the problems they're facing, obviously, is the number of people working, and that yeah. is a problem around the world. It's beginning uh, to be much more of a problem because there's full employment, in effect, in the sense that there are not a lot of jobs. Yeah. Um, unf- well, there are a lot of jobs unfilled, but people aren't wanting to fill them. And we're still seeing in the UK uh, wage pressures. Mm. We're still seeing uh, wage wages going yeah. up, yeah. Uh, whereas many other parts of the world, they're not. They're starting to come down now, and that, that means that impact on inflation is going to be lasting longer in this country as well so that's part of the problem and part of that is because there's just not enough people uh, Mm. and uh, you know not enough people who want to do the jobs that are available yeah well there there is that as well Mm. yeah exactly and so maybe that's part of it it's the mix of jobs but I mean unemployment remains historically low uh, we, uh, you know, th- how are we going to fill jobs? Is the, is yeah, the, is there's the a great big chunk question. of the workforce that are not working. I mean, Where did everyone go? Where you know, with the great resignation. Where yeah. did those other. Well, the great people- resignation is over, we keep hearing, but is it? Are they? Because, well, well, is that because people have just given up? They've, re- they've resigned and they've not gone back? I mean, there's still that push, isn't there, yeah. to try and get people back so into the workplace? So, where are all the workers? Where are they and how do we fix the problem that we just don't have enough people to do the jobs that are available in That's the UK? That's what we will be talking about on the next edition of The Y Care, brought to you by Wigmore Association. Thanks for listening this week. We'll see you next week. Bye. The Y Curve.